I think a lot about my daughter, like how am I gonna make sure she can fail? How am I gonna make sure she doesn't think that the world owes her something because she woke up that morning? But how do you also make sure they don't have to have the struggle we do? Yeah, Tyler, uh, Phaedra Ellis Lankins is the co-founder and CEO of Promise, a startup making it easier for government agencies to collect utilities, taxes, and other fees. Phaedra grew up in San Francisco. Her mother, a single mom, was a waitress. I remember paying, using a food stamp to pay to grocery store, and I remember how people looked at me and like judgment as a young kid, and I was just like, I don't want that for other people. And I think the reason they're drawn to what feels authentic is because everyone is trying to find their tribe. Like, who, who are the people for me? And so I think one of the most valuable questions that I could ask someone like you, how can someone build long-term authentic relationships? Like, what goes into that? Oh my goodness. I feel like this is the most important thing to enrich your life. Is Before we get into the video, YouTube analytics say that 90% of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. If you want to see even bigger guests, better conversations, please subscribe. It really helps us grow the podcast. And with that, onto the video. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Callum Johnson Show. On today's episode, we have Phaedra Ellis Lampkins. Phaedra, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great. I wish we had one of those like... Um, the soundboards, I would do like an applause and stuff. It'd be like, it'd be kind of a cool effect. Um, <laughs> nice. Okay, cool. So here's, here's where I want to begin. Um, I was watching the episode that you did with Jason Calacanis. I think it was from mm -hmm. a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, and you were talking about um, an experience you had working with Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I'm actually... I'm reading his biography at the moment, mm. uh, em Empire State of Mind. Oh, wow. Um, and one of the things you said in the interview, you said he's one of the best business people that you've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. um, let's start here. Can you break it down for the audience? How did you even like start working with Jay-Z? And then what made you say that he was one of the best business people you've ever worked with? This episode is brought to you by Free Agency. If you want to take your career to the next level, Free Agency is a company that you should check out. They manage and represent talent in the tech industry, and they provide you with a dedicated talent agent to help you find, engage, and win top of market roles that will maximize your earning potential. No more leaving money on the table. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with Free Agency. Anyway, back to the show. Well, I worked with uh, really Rock Nation under the leadership of a woman named Desiree Perez, who's remarkable. And, um, is, and I was in music and I was working with the musician Prince and he was incredibly impressed with Jay-Z and what he had done with Tidal Music. And so our first interactions were with Tidal Music. And what I saw with Jay-Z was the first, his team is remarkable and just really smart, thoughtful, um, the second thing that was, it was, was really interesting to me is the way in which they operate with each other, right? It isn't just that they're skilled, it's that they are a team. There is no space. It's they're for each other. And I just thought that type of discipline and relationship was really impressive. And last was there is no, I, I had rarely seen people who were mission oriented and that focused on um, business in terms of like actually making money. It would had usually been like a dichotomy or you'd see like, okay, it is making money or doing good. What was so impressive to me is that there was a discipline about being effective and making money, but really as a vehicle to achieve the goal that they were seeking. And so it just was remarkable, especially because most of the artists I had met were, you know, very much artists. It was, you know, very much um, focused on art and and no compromise and nothing else. And it was interesting to see someone who was, such an amazing artist, but also able to say, I want to make decisions that are good for the community. I want to make decisions that are good, that actually make money. And so it was really just um, remarkable and made me think a lot about what kind of company I wanted, what kind of people I wanted to work with. Um, but it was, he was the most disciplined and especially because in the business community, I, it would always be like HBS, Stanford Business School. And so to see someone who'd created this, who owned so much of their own um, equity and um, it was just just incredibly remarkable and continues to be one of the best models I've seen. Yeah, that's actually it's really interesting because even in the even in the biography that I'm reading, one of the mm -hmm. things they say is that 
very early on in his career, so even as he was establishing himself as a music artist, he was always really focused on the business. And um Right, it's a businessman. Uh, yeah, yeah, the quote, the the quote, I'm a businessman. Um and even like they talk about him working with like Dame Dash. Like he learned a lot of things from Dame about like the business side of things. And even in some of his like big early music videos, um, a lot of artists would just have like these alcohol brands in their video and not really be getting anything from it. And he was like starting to get paid from it. And then he was also starting trying to partner with alcohols that he actually owned to get them in the music video. And so it was like, even at a very early stage, I think to your point, a lot of people that make content or art, they're really about the content. They're like, how do I just make the best content? He was focusing on like the business side of things. Um, The platform. So it's interesting. Yeah. Understanding the whole piece, which I think, you know, rather than just like just the art, it's like, what's the platform that the art is on? How does it get distributed? And it's remarkable to, it really is a next level of artistry to, to think about the whole way that art is delivered and so it's it it continues to be inspiring for me yeah that's really cool and i think um one of the things i think about as well from what you said is how amazing his team was and that he has people that work for him um that are great in their own right but then also great as a collective Mm -hmm. and i think whenever i always say this from from companies that i've worked with the leader, mm-hmm. the person at the top is so important. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's, a, there's like a phrase that like um, a fish rots from the head down. Like everything kind of starts with like the leader at the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm curious, like, obviously you're, you're CEO, uh, founder of Promise. I'm curious, like, what do you... What do you try to be like as a leader? Like what values do you try and uh, bring to your organization? That's a great question. Um, I think I'm still very much a work in progress. Um, I think because I came out of very different workplaces. And I think when I was younger, I came out of, it was very different culturally. And so it was like rough. And you know, like it was, if you were a woman, it was almost behaving like a toxic man, you know? (laughs) It's like you had to be, you know, strength was what you wanted to demonstrate and discipline. And you, you almost had been told to like, to, to take out all like of your femininity and of the care and the concern. And so it's been interesting to me as a leader to, to think about how do you embrace kind of what you, who you want to be and how you want to show up and how do you make sure other people have the space to do that? So um, I think a lot about measuring success. I deeply care in making the experience for people who need aid um, graceful, having dignity. And I think that always is my North Star. How do we create an experience that is amazing for people who often don't have folks who create experiences for them that are amazing and beautiful and have, you know, design. Um, and then I think a lot about um, how to be a place where people can be their fullest self, because I think when you want people to imagine they can do things that, that don't, aren't getting done, right? It's like most places in the private sector, people are just saying like, let's make as much money as possible. Here, we're trying to say, can you build a model that's not predatory? How do you build a system in capitalism in which you have a greatest good, not just a greatest profit, and that you don't sacrifice one for the other? And so for me, it is um, getting people to believe they can be magical. And so if you want magic to happen, you need magical people. And those people that have to be able to be their fullest self, being like their self with their own, um, you know, uh, whatever other people find crazy, I always find like amazing. And so, um, and, and that's, I think what I'm interested in about is how do you create an environment where people get to be who they are and they get to believe in magic and they get to bend the arc of justice so that capitalism is used for black, brown and poor people. Hmm. Now, there was a, there's a few really interesting things that you said there. And I, and I want to talk about your, your company and what you guys are doing. Um, but before we get to that, I thought when you were talking about like how you want to show up as a leader, and even you gave the example of um, like feeling at, at times, it's almost like you have to take on the traits of like... Um, of like what a man would be, like a, like what traditionally people see as a leader. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And it made me think that you, I always like to take things back to the foundation, the fundamentals. And before you can lead anyone else, you have to be able to lead yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you have to know who you are first before anyone can follow you. And I thought it was interesting, even how you just started your answer, that you're like a work in progress. Um, it made me think it's like a constant journey or always like trying to figure out who you are um, and what's authentic to you. I'm curious, are there, is there an experience that you reflect on in your life mm -hmm. that you just feel gave you a lot of clarity, gave you a lot of confidence in who you are as a person? And if so, like, what would you say that experience is? That's a great question. I think I probably have like defining moments in my life more than one experience. Like I remember paying, using a food stamp to pay to grocery store. And I remember how people looked at me and like judgment as a young kid. And I was just like, I don't want that for other people. I think um, I, I probably have more experiences where I was like, oh, this is, this is not what I want for other people. And um, I remember when I was in high school, we were organizing a walkout, right? Because of some things that were happening in the school district. And I just remember being like the power of a collective. And so I think I'm probably more inspired by, oh, like here are bad things I don't want to happen. Here's the power of a collective. Here are good things that I want to have happen. And how do those things go together? And I think I've always felt like, you know, the reality is when you try to do hard stuff, people shit on you, right? They say bad mm -hmm. things sometimes, they say mean things. And, and so I think you can only live with that if you feel like you are centered in what your greatest purpose is. There's a great book by Martha Beck about integrity. And the thing that she argues is that integrity is really just, it's not a question of like good or bad. It's a question of fulfilling your greatest purpose. And you feel it, you know it when you're like in that zone. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that it's just one experience, but it is more a sense of when are you at your greatest purpose, when deflection doesn't matter, when other things don't matter. It's like, when do you feel I'm in alignment with what I am supposed to do, what God intended for me to do, what I feel like is right for me or whatever, you know, God, I think that you people have whatever higher purpose they believe in. And so for me, it is more of a, I feel when I am in my purpose. Hmm. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, I see everything is like, I see everything in like a sports context. So I always have like a sports mm. analogy that I, I feel things in. And, um, it reminds me of one of the things that, uh, Tom Brady spoke about, which is like the concept of the man in the arena. Hmm. Of like, there's like all this chatter around you. There's so much like distraction, so many things going on, um, which I guess in a way is like what you said, like people shitting on, shitting on you or like shitting on like your vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the man in the arena, it's like quiet. So it's like in the stands, there's like commotion, there's pandemonium, there's cheering, there's booze and whatever. But for the person in the game, it's just quiet because you have that, that clarity of, I guess it's the clarity of your calling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I think that's, um, I think that's interesting. I want to, I want to talk about, um, I always find those defining moments, those early moments, mm -hmm. very interesting. And you spoke mm -hmm. about the experience of being in like a grocery store, paying with food stamps and like the look mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like, I guess it's like the judgment and just feeling that. Um, why do you think that, why do you think that specifically, like, why did that hit so much? And then how, I, I feel like a lot of things that we do today in our lives as adults, it's like you can see the direct path from like when we were kids. Like a lot mm -hmm. of, even some of the things that I do now, I'm sure that like, if you really went deep into my life, there's something that happened as a child that is why I'm so mo motivated to do what I'm doing now. Um, do you think, so, so I guess one is why did that moment resonate so much for you? And do you think it has an effect? Maybe an effect isn't the right word, but do you think there's, can you see the path to how it ladders to what you're doing right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the reason I think you know disdain when you see it, right? And I think mm -hmm. as a kid, the thing that I was so clear on is I was lucky in that I was like a gifted and talented program, like a kid in a gifted and talented program. 
And all the kids had, well, I shouldn't say it felt like it. Who knows what's true if I was like, you know, you see things so differently yeah. as an adult is it felt like I for sure was the only black child. And um, it felt like I was the only poor child. And so, um, and, and I think my mom is white and my father's black. And so even as a young age, I could see, and my mom is, was much more working class. My um, dad's family, like my, my Nana was grand. I always think of her as very grand and elegant. And it was clear to me that my working class white family was treated better or assumptions were made differently than they were made about my black family. And so it just as a kid, you start to make these observations about like my grandmother is grand, my Nana, my dad's mom, who's like this amazing sparkling human who's like um, built her own uh, wealth. And my mom's family who's, you know, working class, my mom was a waitress and, you know, even things like following my grandma around a store versus my mom, who was a little shady. <laughs> it's like uh, just seeing the difference in the way people were treated. So I think I early on understood the distinct, the, the way that people were treated was different. And it was clear to me being in a store that not having money, that people could say things or like, I remember I bought cake and they're like, are you supposed to use cake with your food stamps? And, um, and so it just became very clear to me that, that people thought you were less than. And I became um, very interested, I think, as an adult, especially as how do you, you don't want that experience, not just for adults, but for children. And so I think for me, the, the thing is, if you know what that feels like, you can't not want other people to have that experience. Like you want people to not have that same experience. I want that for my own children. I want that for other people's children. And working in the labor movement, it was very clear to me um, how heroic uh, so many people were who had immigrated to this country who were working two jobs, who were putting up with madness for because they wanted a better life for their children. Mm. And so I think it was more, I felt the disdain and in, and in the same, um, my same self, I felt inspired by the people who I thought often faced disdain. Like working with janitors who had left Central America, come to this country, living in garages with multiple families to be able to support their children. Um, like how how could you not be attracted to the person who does that, who takes that leap, who sacrifices their family, and and so it it really is those thematics which which is when I feel most aligned, when I feel most my calling from God, when I'm like these are my people, these are my tribe, my tribe are the people that take the risk to make their children have a better life, and you want to be with your tribe and you want your tribe to do well, and so it is just like even now like I run a company that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars and. My people still are not tech dudes who build software. My people are the call center folks in our office, <laughs> you know, mm. the folks who are impacted by our work. And so I, I think it's, it really is that, that all of those incidents just made clear who my people were, who I feel most comfortable with, who I want to work with, who I feel want, who I want to be proud of me. Like I, I remember when I was a kid, um, you know, like you see these magazines and um, I was so proud to be in Jet Magazine, which I'm not even sure if it's still around in the way that it was before, but it was no like, okay, you don't know what Jet Magazine I've, is? I've, no. <laughs> I oh know. my goodness. Okay. You... It's your, it's your age. So back in the days, um, mm -hmm. there was a magazine that came out, Jet, which also had like the Jet Beauty of the Week where there's like a woman in a um, bikini, often bathing suit. And it was like the magazine that um, black families often at like your hair shop, getting your hair cut or a beautician. And it was like, it was, you know, it's Ebony Essence Jet. There are like three magazines that black people read that people saw. So like when I was in that magazine, oh my, more proud than anything because my grandma I knew could go to the beauty shop and be like, that's my baby. <laughs> and so <laughs> those experiences for me were much more important to me than anything else. Yeah. I, I do find that interesting. It's like um, a lot of things in life that are the most meaningful, are, they're like small moments. And even what you talk about, like with the tribe, I think about, because um, my grandma was like born in, in Sierra Leone, uh, grew up in Sierra Leone, and she made a decision. Um, she had, what is it, four kids. Um, wow. And so three girls and then my dad. And she actually had another son, actually, so five. And she made a decision just to take my dad and they moved to Scotland. Mm. Um, and then obviously, uh, like, my dad moved to London and that's where he met my mom and that, like, it set the stage, I guess, for even, like, what I'm doing now. And I, I think about that because she, she was a nurse. But that one decision 
moved our family that moved us forward like generations like the and and now obviously i live in america and it's like um i just think how quickly that really took place of like my family was in sierra leone and now we're in the states and i'm in manhattan and like building something but the stage was set so many like decades prior um and I think to your point, it's so important to, it's important to remember where you came from. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious, you know, like what keeps you grounded? Because yeah. even what you said about you're, you're building a company that's worth hundreds of millions and you obviously still not only remember, but still feel deeply tied to something that happened when you were in a completely different economic situation. Mm-hmm. So what keeps you grounded to that little girl that was in the grocery store, um, paying with the food stamps? What keeps you grounded to that while you're actually a CEO of like, of this successful company? That's a great question. Thanks. Well, one, I'm so inspired by your grandmother's story because it, it, it's what you're doing is such a testament to her. And then you just think, you, you know, like everything you do is built on the foundation of her sacrifice and her mm, work. 100%. And so it's like, you know, like it's like almost like your destiny is to fulfill every hope she had for you, which is both an honor and a stress. Like you can say like carrying the mm. privilege and the like, <gasps> I have to get up to yeah. it. Um, I think for me um one i don't think i'm fancy right like i still wear i um i'm not comfortable um around uh i still you know like i still very much identify as a working class kid and um but i do like some things that are different (laughs) at this point in my life i will say i like (laughs) i like to be comfortable more than i used to be um um but i think i think there is such honor in working hard and i don't think we give enough honor and grace like the amount of work it takes to work a minimum wage job and raise your kids and get them to school and um just the the dignity of work for me is still very compelling i'm still very moved by it and um and so i think it's just i there's like a saying right but for the grace of god there you know there go i essentially Mm. and i I'm always prepared at some, I worked at a grocery store when I was in college and I'm always like, I could be at any point in my life, go back to being in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I've seen too many people have a lot and lose it all. And so I don't presume that I would not end up at a different place. And if you think that that is the place in which you will end up potentially, then you think of it as a place you need to be able to call home. So I think of, um myself still very much as a kid like i imagine i could need to go live where my like at some point in my life who knows what happens maybe i need to live where i live when i grew up maybe i need to you know like i just i still see that as my people and i'm still um i'm not sure it's so much as it's just my uh, personal values but it's where i'm comfortable and Mm. i don't think a lot about like good restaurants like i still eat taco but you know like it's what i what i look at in my life is is you know like that's just where i'm comfortable i you know i like to be comfortable in my clothes i like to be comfortable with my people i think um i'm also very much interested in tr- like uh, uh trauma and kids like how trauma impacts children and poverty and racism and things like that and so um yeah so i just think i i don't know that i um i'm just a i like being comfortable and i like people who have high level of integrity and who are honest and simple and because it keeps my life simple. Like I don't, I don't have any desire for chaos or, you know, mm. madness or anything like that. Cause you have to do it at work a little bit. So I just want, I want calm and goodness around me when I'm not at work. Yeah. No, I like that. There's so many, like, um, there's so many good principles in what you just said, right? Which is like the, the dignity of work of just putting in, of just putting in the work, um, calmness, integrity, um, it's all things that are built over time. You have to put your time in. Um, so I love that. You know what? I want to I wanna talk about the thing that you're putting your time in right now. Um, obviously, you're the CEO of Promise. Uh, can you just talk to the audience about what you guys do? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, sure. go for it. Um, we uh, promise the easiest way to think about what we do is we help government move money to the people that need it the most. So we help people bring in money to government, which is people do interest-free payment plans. So if you have a debt, what anything from a water bill to a criminal justice bill, we don't want people to lose their water, end up incarcerated. And so you can put something on an interest-free flexible payment plan so you don't face the consequence right away. What we're increasingly doing is helping people get money out really beautifully. That looks like in the state of Virginia, getting people water assistance and trying to figure out how an application happens in less than 15 minutes. And, um, and so that's what we do. And it's really all about, I always think about like when you buy a Peloton or when you have money, buy now, pay later, everything is like easy. Like the more money you have, the easier it gets, the less money you have, the harder it gets. So mm. you want to pay a debt to the government. They're like, come in, bring your taxes, prove you're poor, pay interest. If you have money, they're like get a Peloton, no interest, get it today, <laughs> pay for it tomorrow. And it's just like the tax on Poverty is just unacceptable. It should be easier when you're struggling. And the idea you can take a day off work, pay for parking, it's just the assumptions we make about poor people is unacceptable. And so Promise is really a company servicing government and the people that rely on it and trying to build a world-class service. Hmm. That's special, actually. That's special. <laughs> I've always, I've always, um, there's always been like the quote of like the rich get richer. Um, mm -hmm. Of like, and, it, and it, it speaks exactly to what you just said, right? Which is like, when you have things, it gets easier to get more things. Um, totally. Whether it's just because of your network and like who you know, or like the resources yeah. you already have, I mean, it's easier for those to compound. Um, and I thought, I thought even when I was doing my research on you and even what you said earlier, which is like a lot of the things that help or they say that they are good, like to help poorer communities are actually mm -hmm. predatory. Um, <gasps> oh, like really? they're actually, um, yes. they're exploitative. And I'm curious from n knowing that in your mind, what do you, if, if that's the norm, right? If that's like yeah. the, the, the normal line, that's the baseline. When you're thinking about building this company, how do you think about building it strategically so that's not the case? Um, well, one, it's hard, right? It's not easy because like when we started, we originally were focused on the criminal justice system and then we, and we would try to do good things. And then I had a moment that was a defining moment for me, which is when someone in, a, in California in a progressive county said, I said, oh, we're building this great experience for people in the system. And she said, um, oh yeah, we don't want it to be good for people. We don't care about their experience in the system. And I was like, ah, I'm trying to build a system. And I'd been in the South and had a horrible experience in the South. And mm -hmm. I just realized like any efficiency we created for the criminal justice system was ultimately harmful. Not because the specific thing we were doing was bad, but because the system was so committed to harming people of color and poor people that by making the system more efficient, we would ultimately cause a consequence. And so we decided we couldn't build a system, the system we wanted with the outcomes we wanted in the criminal justice system and the way that we were doing it. And so part of what it made really clear is we needed to go places where our incentives were aligned, right? We wanted actually the same thing. The problem the criminal justice system had been, if you're working for a, a not great sheriff, his power fiefdom might be, the more people that are in jail, the bigger my fiefdom is. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to get people out of jail. And so the reason we ended up in payment space is because we were like, we want to work with people who want people to not end up in the system. They want to get them off the debt. They want to get them out of the system. And that's where, for us, that's where the incentives were aligned. And that's where we realized that's where, that's where the sweet spot for us is as a company is finding places in which our incentives are aligned. Mm. You know what? I, I, um, one of the things I love about doing podcast episodes and conversations in, like this and, um, not to toot my own horn, but like when, when I feel like it's a good conversation is mm -hmm. there will be consistent threads throughout the conversation, right? And if you're listening mm -hmm. carefully enough, you will hear the threads. And mm -hmm. one of the things you said earlier on, you spoke about a tribe, about, mm -hmm. um, about like serving the tribe, building within the tribe, the power of the collective. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about incentives being aligned. When I think about incentives being aligned, I think like the ultimate representation of that should be a tribe, 
Like it should be, a, it's、mm. a group of people working together, all with one common goal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know, even when you talk about you like to work with people with integrity, I think、mm-hmm. that there's power in being selective in who you work with.、Mm-hmm. I think sometimes、um, it's not just about on, on, on the pod, it's not just about like telling the stories of, of mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. remarkable people like yourself, it's also like the principles.、Mm-hmm. It's like why you're doing what you're doing. And、mm-hmm. I don't know, it's just very consistent and it shines through that you're selective with who you work with. And I think so. <laughs> Was that correct? No, it is because I just sent this.、Um, I'm going to find this. I just sent this meme that is making me laugh. I'm so sorry when you said that. And my meme that everyone who knows me was laughing at was I sent this thing. That said,、um, if we have a set plan and you hit me up at the last minute, oh, my friend you haven't met is going to join you.、Um, I'm canceling and you're on plans probation with me. No plans for a while. You need time to think about your values. <laughs> 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 and I was thinking when you said that, like the people you work with, this I've worked selective. with this, I've select group of people in, so you're so spot on. I've done three different things music. Uh, for profit, non profit, I have the same team around me in each of those institutions. And so, anyways, it's when you said that I just started laughing and I was like, and I'm like,、uh, yes, I was like, yes, I just laughed because I just said to people, I was like, <laughs> you know, like, oh, this whole new friend thing, new thing, it's like, it seems like a lot of energy and work. <laughs> no, that's good. You know, when I said that, I was not expecting you to laugh at that. I was like, what? What is this?、Um... No, no I'm、funny. because Ruben, or, or <laughs> who, who we talked about, Ruben Harris, who I worked with, is that is who I am. Like, I, it, to me, it seems exhausting to, I'm so impressed with people. It's just not my skill set. And, and, and that I think is what I saw when I looked at Jay Z or other people. I was like, there is a way for you to build tribe and build, right? Not just build community, but actually use that tribe to have consistent values, to continue to build, to think about it in different ways, to leverage that group of people so that you're not starting over. At every place. And so it just it made me laugh because I think it's a, a great strength of mine, but it also a weakness because I'm like, oh, new people, that seems like a whole lot of work. You know what?、Um, I, think, I think the world increasingly is moving in that direction. I think,、um, mm-hmm. and I feel like I've experienced it from doing content, which is that、mm. people are really drawn to what feels authentic. And I think、mm-hmm. the reason they're drawn to what feels authentic is because、mm-hmm. everyone is trying to find their tribe. They're trying、mm-hmm. to find, like, like, who are my people? And, like, I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be hoodwinked. Like,、mm-hmm. who, who are the people for me? And so I think one of the most valuable questions that I could ask someone like you, and you mentioned that you have, like, you have the same people that you've been working with from doing music. To for profit,、mm-hmm. non profit.、Mm-hmm. How can someone build long term, authentic relationships? Like, what goes into that? Oh my goodness. I feel like this is the most important thing to enrich your life is long term, deep, good friendship. And because you can weather any storm when you feel safe and secure. And when you have your people, it just, to me, it's a transformative thing. Um, I, um, uh, I, uh, one of my friends who I, I also work with told me once, you were raised by wolves. And what she meant、mm-hmm. is like being my mom is, was very、uh, rough, was maybe the nice way to say it. And so she'd just be like, oh, you know, <laughs> you suck for the following reasons. And, and so as I thought about relationships, what, what I realized was really important to me is a level of, Um, being able to be honest with one another because otherwise it would feel chaotic and crazy for me. So I, I think there is no deeper love.、Um, and I think even with my partner, the thing that is important for me to him is like, not, it's not just our deep love. It's that I know I can count on him. I know that I love him. I know that even when the, in long term relationships, some days you like them a little less than the other day, but I never want our friendship to not be there. And that friendship is, I think, sometimes what sustains you. And so I just think. The best thing you can do is find people who see you, who give you the grace to 
um, make mistakes, who are authentically for you and who you can make mistakes with. And, but I think to me, there is no thing, there's nothing that has been more important to my personal success, right? Just not making it through the stuff that wasn't the best, you know, like figuring stuff out. And um, especially I think for people who didn't grow up, like no one ever, I didn't think failure was good. Like who, who, when you're a poor kid, black kid, like who tells you like fail and the world will, you know, clap and create space for you again. And that's what to me, deep friendships did is mm. like, oh, okay. If you fail, you're not a horrible person. You, you, you're, even though I think I'm ready to go to my mom's house and work at the mall or work at the or <laughs> grocery store, my friends are like, that's not a reality for you. And, and so I just think having those deep, friendships or a tribe is is critical and um i think you know i you know I, I cannot recommend it highly enough and it is for me the key to where i've been what i've been able to achieve mm. I, yeah no, it's so it's so interesting it's um i just find it interesting how things start and like mm -hmm. um like your 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 foundation of like building relationships a lot of it starts with your parents um mm and it's funny it's funny when you say that your mom was like um like pretty direct because mm -hmm. my mom is exactly the same way and it's funny because like my siblings uh, like will joke we're like whose mom like talks to them like this like some of it she, she tells you stuff so directly that yes. um but it's it's true it's kind of like a lot of my relationships I really value that like just right. no like just truly yeah and it feels comfortable to me like if it's just thing. if it's too just not everything's nice 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 it doesn't feel right like it feels like there's there's um there's something missing and yes. I think an another thing with my mom she was so she's been so committed to us like her children mm -hmm. that it does create this stability I think in your life which encourage, at least for me, it's encouraged risk taking, because mm. even though things are scary and mm -hmm. things are intimidating, mm -hmm. it's like as long as that original collective is in place, nothing actually really matters. Like if I, if, for instance, like I, I left my job uh, about a week and a half ago to do this podcast mm -hmm. full time and to build mm -hmm. a media company. And I, and I did it because I truly believe in it. Like, I truly believe in what I have. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't work out, it's like, I, I have the, the collective is there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the most important thing for me, I remember when I I'd made the decision, I was in Florida on holiday. I'd made the decision that I was leaving. I spoke to my mom and my older brother first. And the mm -hmm. only thing I wanted to know was from their perspective, does this seem like something I would do? Like, does this seem like a Callum thing to do? And they were like, yeah, <laughs> like to leave your job, in, <laughs> to leave your job in Manhattan in tech and just go all in on a podcast that you like love, but it's making like no money at the moment. Like that is something you would do. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, um, no, that is such so. a testament to your mama. I hope my kids, yeah. like, I hope that I, I have a 10 year old left at home and I mean, that's all you want. You want to build a foundation for your kids where they mm. feel like you, you have them and that they can go be in the world. So, mm. um, amazing for your mom that, um, I, uh, that she did that. And I, I just want to, I, the best lesson for today, cause as the mom who is like, I try to be softer than my mom, I'm a little softer, but I'm still mm. like, that doesn't work. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that doesn't make sense and, and so i appreciate that that it, it left you feeling that way because i do think there is mm, i think i think that's a testament and i and i hope i hope you tell your mom that i hope she feels that because i think you know it's important yeah and, and you're a remarkable i i um an interviewer like which is very interesting to me because i don't do a lot of uh stuff um, because I'm mostly antisocial as a human, and I think the um, I think you are a remarkable interviewer, and so I, it makes sense that you would take that leap of faith. And incredible for you, but also incredible to your mama that you know, she created that. Because I'm sure it's scary for her. You you really you want to tell your kids, yes, go run, but you're like, who's going to support that? You know, like it's the mm -hmm. 
we have one getting married right now and you're just like before we were like we're not gonna help with the wedding unless you get through college and then she got through college and then we we're like well what about a master's we didn't just meet a bachelor's we like, get yeah. to college. and so i think it's remarkable yeah no I, I actually i really appreciate that um and i would even say and this is something that my mum and i we've spoken about as well is um it's really like the like being direct it's like a journey with that and your children especially mm -hmm. Be because um and, it, and it's funny like how my parents are, are different um my dad is like a very almost the opposite side like i could do this i could do the smallest i show the smallest bit of potential and he's like you're gonna take that to the moon i believe in you you got this and then my mom is like you need to show her the evidence first like she needs to see something mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. and um my parents were separated so i grew up with i grew up with them like lived with them at different points in my childhood and it like me and my mom we would we would butt heads at a certain point because the fact that she would need to see so much evidence it felt to me like doubt like it felt like um mm. it felt like doubt and i hated that i didn't like any any doubt because i've um i think self-belief is something that that i've had um but i think as a parent it's like i think what you said before is important which is understanding you're going to make mistakes Mm -hmm. um i think i think parents put like a lot of pressure on themselves to be perfect oh my god to and totally yeah totally and you want i'm so impressed it's like hearing about your dad you know i my i was raised by a single parent and so it's been interesting as a uh parent you begin to realize how important the dad figure is for children and mm -hmm. having you know and of course amazing women and parents who do it all by themselves we should you know it's it is what it is but and they, we should be like, tell them how amazing they are and all wonderful things they do. But it's been remarkable for someone who didn't grow up with a dad and didn't have a lot of men around to, didn't grow up with a dad in my home, I have a father mm. <laughs> who's a good person, <laughs> is, um, uh, it, it, it is remarkable to me how important that is. And, and having you get that sense of self at home is so mm. critical. Cause you like having someone believe in you. And I realize, for me, I want that for my, like, I want that for all the little people in my life. And, but you also think like, but can they believe that? Right. Like the thing is if they also are raised with a parent who's like, mm, I, I, I remember with one of my girlfriends and I was like, oh yeah, that doesn't look that great. And she was like, you can't tell your kids that. And I was like, well, someone's thinking it. They should know. What I'm <laughs> like, I don't want them to go in the world. It's like, it's much better for them to hear it from me. Uh, and she was like, no. And so there's like, it is this hard tension as a parent where you want to just like protect them and say, everything is amazing. But you also want them to be prepared for the world. And so it sounds like your, your parents did a remarkable job at kind of balancing that where your dad's like, yes, in fact, you forget it. Poor Oprah in six months, you're going to be <laughs> taking over her empire. Right. And your mom's like, seems good, but you do want to make sure you got some money in the bank. Right. Like we're not yeah. just jumping with, right. It's like, yeah. That's really you, impressive. You know, you know where my mind goes? It's like, um, things that are worth having are difficult to attain so mm -hmm. if you want if you want to have confidence and i'm not talking about like uh bravado or ego like mm -hmm. true confidence mm -hmm. that's difficult to attain so mm -hmm. i think one of the the biggest thing that my mom's given me is probably like it's true confidence because i don't doubt what she says mm -hmm. Like, I know that she's so, I've always just heard the direct thing. I've always heard the, the mm. harsh truth. So who I am as a person, my decisions, they're being based off something which is true. Like it's her yeah. real opinion. And I think yeah. you can feel that. I think you even feel that as a kid. It's like, is my parent being honest with me? Like, do they really think I did a good job? Or are they just telling me that? Because they think that's what they should say. And so for me, it's like my, I think, um, I'm very fortunate in the sense that my, I felt like I got built a good foundation. Mm. Um, and, and then once you have the good foundation, it's like, where do you want to take it? Like, what are you, mm. what are you going to do with it? Um, mm. Yeah, so I, I say that to say, maybe your kids will disagree with me, but I'm like, keep being direct and honest. Yeah, I know, and they're going to be like, ah! <laughs> no, I, I, think, uh, I think the only difference is, I think 
some children now are growing like our my like my 10 year old is way is as amazing kind beautiful human being but is growing up with privilege mm. and so uh, you know like i grew up poor so i didn't have expectation of certain things mm. and i remember we were talking about like uh, parents hitting children i never hit my daughter she was like oh my god if someone hit me i would call the police and i would blah 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 and i was just like what like what are you <laughs> talking about and i i feel like that we had a whole conversation about the police but separate of my, or her relationship with the police it was i realized she has such a sense of what you want right but you're also just like oh my gosh is she is just like if someone were to dare hit me i would mm. call them like the government should intervene immediately and realize how outrageous this is i mean i never like i can't i mean i i just yeah, I was like, I, I, I thought the collective could kill me, right? Like, if I, mm. my aunt would come beat me up, if my mom, you know, like, not yeah. really, but just be like, pull me, you know, like, so yeah. it's just interesting. I think also the dynamic of when you grow up with, you know, thinking about, you know, these things. So I'm just like, and it's interesting as I look as an employer, it's interesting to see how privilege impacts the way that people work, even. And so I think mm. a lot about my daughter, like, how am I going to make sure she can fail? How am I going to make sure? She she doesn't think that the world owes her something because she woke up that morning. And mm -hmm. um, but how do you also make sure they don't have to have the struggle we do? And so so I think I think I think this is this is a lot of the stuff that, that I think about. It's so weird. It's like, how do you measure success? It's it's is it as you evolve and just get older as a human being, like I think a lot more about will my kids like will I have been a good parent? Will I have been a good partner? And that matters more to me than will I have been good at work at this point. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Would you say that there's almost like landmark moments in your life, right? And uh, one of the one of the ones that comes to mind is like you you graduate high school or you graduate university. You get your first job. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, like you started your company. Um, that thing you just said of like. The importance of family and your kids over the work. Do you think that's a conversation that if I spoke to Phaedra at 18, Phaedra at 22, Phaedra at 30, do you think you would have said that or would it have been something different? No, totally not. I think, I mean, I, I had my last, my baby, I had her at 10. I mean, I had her as 35, I'm just 10 now. Um, and so, or 36. And so I, uh, we had other children we were raising before that. And I was like working all the time because I thought economic freedom is what I want for these. Like, you know, and also the healthcare, private school, like you, 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 you want what you didn't have, right? And I wanted stability for them and I wanted opportunity. And I missed so much because I'd get home at seven o'clock at night. I, um, and I, I missed the interactions, right? And so now when I look at my 10 year old, who's had me around all the time, who's like sick of me, it's devastating, right? But also it, it makes me really happy. But, but I think you, you want for people you love, sometimes not just what they didn't have, but what you didn't have. And so what I wanted for the kids was no one screaming at the house, no, you know, like no trauma, as much as I could control it, no abuse, no, you know, like, like just, and so for me, if you had economic freedom, and and no trauma at home like i won the world series right just like that's like every you should get every parenting award as i've gotten older i've begun to realize those are really baselines like eating and not getting beaten up <laughs> those are yeah. not those are not like you know like aspirational so as i get older i'm starting to realize you know like you you want something different so i definitely think and it's funny because uh one of the older kids said like they're very, they sat me down. There's three of them. They sat me down at my, the 10 year olds, it was her eighth birthday party. And they were just like, we just think you are not on top of this parenting thing. And they were like, <laughs> you are just like, you are just, and because I was so uh, strict with them, like I didn't, I was like, why do you need to spend the night somewhere else? We have a house. What do you need a cell phone for? <laughs> you should go to bed at like nine o'clock. Like, you know, like all, I, I believed in struck. At one point we had five children in our house. And so I believe, you know, like structure was important. And so now I'm just like, what? You want to watch TV? I didn't allow TV during the week. 
now I'm like, what? Hour 52 of TV sounds like a great plan. Yeah. So, so no, I definitely would not have had the same vision at even probably 30 as I did, as I do at this point in my life, where I'm just like, I just, you know, you, you want, I want the world to be better. I want peace. I want, um, it's interesting because I want a bigger impact, but a smaller life. That's a nice way to end that. Like, just, I want a bigger impact, but a smaller life. You know, you know what, um, I think they, they call it like the hero's journey. I remember hearing about it, which is you're, you're young and you have all of these, these things that you want in your life. And a lot of the things that you want, it's, it's because something was lacking in your childhood. Something was missing. And you just felt so aggrieved and you felt it so deeply that these things were missing and you just wanted to do something about it. And, and I feel that. I think even in my life, like part of the reason I want to achieve at a certain level and build economic freedom and build resources, both for my community and like my family, is um, I just feel it. It feels personal to me. Mm -hmm. And you go on this journey to achieve it. And if you're fortunate enough, you actually, you get everything you wanted. And what they say in the hero's journey is that you, you think you got kind of what you wanted. And then you kind of just end up just coming back. Um, it's almost like fleeting. The satisfaction from it was fleeting. And you almost return to where you were at the beginning, wherever was home. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I think it's. I think it's interesting. Like that's what I. When it, when you said that, it's kind of it. It was almost like it played out. I, I I like the heroes. I like the narrative of that. So I was like, oh, interesting. But go ahead, please. Yeah. No, I was gonna say it's interesting. Even for someone like me, who I feel like I just feel so early. I feel like I'm in such an early stage. Um, like there's so much more to come. It's interesting speaking to you um like more of the like you have like the wisdom you have the experience um but for someone for someone um at my age or the young woman mm -hmm. who's starting in her career who looks at someone like you who despite the odds and the statistics and everything that we hear in news and media and everything has managed to build a company to a certain level and and you know what you said something that I think would really resonate with people which is like not only a company that's making that's having impact but also making money sometimes I feel like we feel like we have to sacrifice it's like one or the other mm -hmm. you're either doing yeah, something absolutely. good or you're making money and if you're making money you're probably not doing something good yes what is like um for someone that's looking to do that they're coming from yeah. humble beginnings. If you could give a piece of advice, um, I, think, I think in any journey, there's, like, there's the things that are really important and then there's the things that are like secondary. It's like the 80-20 principle. Mm -hmm. There's 20% that creates the 80%. Mm -hmm. If you were gonna look back at your story, your mm -hmm. experience, what is the 20% that you think that young woman, young man really needs to focus on in order to, in order to, to kind of build and do some of the things that you've done and have that happen in their life? Hmm. It's, so, it's such an interesting question. Um, one thing is I, I wanna acknowledge, um, it's always, you know, like I remember looking at people and like people who had money or had certain things, I'm like, oh, you should spend more time with your family. And you'd be like, yeah, because you're not like stressed about how you're going to pay your rent. So <laughs> one thing I just want to acknowledge is that I don't worry about paying my rent anymore, right? I don't worry about the, I still am like a nervous Nelly because of how I grew up, but the reality is probably I will be fine. And my kids will, you know, like everyone I think will be fine. Um, so when I look back, I look back not, I look back from a place of comfort, which I think is an important distinction to make. So I don't have, I definitely aspirationally want more because I want my children's future to be determined. I want to have great impact, 
But so, but when I look back at life, I look back at like, I wish I would have spent more time with my grandmother before she died. I wish if I could talk to myself that I had taught myself joy more because I think especially as, as people of color, I think as people who grew up without a lot is we're just trying to get somewhere. And so it's like the journey is like getting somewhere. It's not the journey. Right. And so I wish I had like stopped and, and said like at each point, oh, wow, this feels like a huge accomplishment. But I really, at each point, I would look and go, gosh, I still have so far to go, instead of looking behind and saying, wow, I achieved a lot. And it's only, I think, in the last, you know, two years of my life where I was just like, oh, wow, I, I have done some stuff. Like, you know, <laughs> it's like, mm. um, and so I think the the thing I wish I had felt, and I, I wish this, especially I think about as you think about yourself, is I hope that you have joy in the journey because I think the journey is you, this is all you got. This is it. And so I, I just hope for you and I hope for, I wish for me. And I, and I think about that's what I think about as a parent is I want, I want joy and I want, um, I think happiness is sometimes overrated, but I think, um, it's, it's more about like individual moments of joy versus one consistent state. And so I just, I hope that when you, people have it, and I wish this for myself, that you would have like held on to ex every extra second. Cause then you're at, as an older age, I'm like, oh my God, this is so happy. Like, how can I stay in this space for as long as possible? And then the chaos comes back, you know, like the, the good chaos of just like, a something's gonna take longer than we thought, you know, like, oh, we're, you know, do whatever. But I just think, um, I, I wish that I had understood the joy in being where I was. That's so, that's interesting. And um, I'm going to be I'm going to be very, very honest with the audience as well. Um, and you as well. Um, I think for me, I'm cognizant that these are these are like the best moments. I think when you're experiencing things for the first like few times, it's when you feel it the deepest. It's like um, even artists will talk about that. I remember listening to an interview with Drake and obviously he has like so many hits. Um, at a certain point, that just feels like what's normal to you. You can he can never get back the feeling of that first song, and I remember him even talking about like when he first started to get a bit of a buzz, when he first met Lil Wayne, when he first performed mm -hmm. at Madison Square Garden. Um, mm -hmm. those those were the magical moments. So I think I know I know in my mind, um, that these are these are some of the best moments right now like like what's happening now but i also just with how i with how i grew up and like i i feel early and there's so mm -hmm. there's so many things that i want to achieve mm -hmm. and and there's also things that you're battling against right like mm -hmm. you're um you feel the doubt both from yourself mm -hmm. and from other people um mm -hmm. you feel like even what you mentioned about like paying the rent, like there's, there's, there's shorter timelines in your life. There's shorter deadlines. Um, you don't have as much runway. Mm -hmm. And so I know these are the best moments, but I'm also, it's hard not to think ahead mm -hmm. because there's, there's something that you, you just want to prove, like you want to get at it. You just want to show mm -hmm. that like I did this, like mm -hmm. I was correct. Yeah. I, I just want to tell you, I don't think these are the best moments. And I have to say, as you get older, it mm. it does, like, there is, when I was younger, I worried about what everyone thought about me. It was like, oh, you know, now I'm just like, my people like me, I'm, I'm okay. Like, you know, like, mm. whatever. So I think what's different is the, I don't, I don't uh, smoke, but there's like, or, or, or edible eat, but there's like a, a quick, like the high is easier right now, right? Mm. It's like, it's like, oh, that first. And so that mm. that's the difference is I would say is like, you should enjoy it because it takes a little longer to get there next time. <laughs> so it's mm. like, oh, I want to. So it isn't that this is the, the only best. It's that this is the easiest in some ways to, to get to that moment. And so when you get there to, to like when it's like, oh, my God, I can pay my rent for three months, like sit in that and just enjoy it. Because all of a sudden when you got five houses or three, you know, like it just it becomes more complicated. But I do want to say. I think that growing old is underrated, at least in your 40s. Who no, I don't, maybe I'll come back and be in my 70s. It's horrible. But <laughs> it's like, there is a level of confidence and comfort that, 
yeah, but 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 yeah, I I think it is enjoy it. You should still keep you know like anyone should keep you know getting to where they got to go, and you should use that energy. But like, how amazing you quit your job, you took a leap of faith. If you had a family and someone to support, you might not do the same thing. And so it's like just sit in the pleasure of like. I just did what most people cannot afford to do. I just did the thing that, you know, like puts me in a remarkable and just like sit in that and feel it and feel yourself. And um, there's this song by Carrie Hilson's like, I'm so pretty. Like, and I just was like, let me give that to every person I love. Like just walking around, like I'm so pretty. Like just, you know, like it's mm -hmm. like, that to me is the, it, it, you know, that's the joy, but also gives you more power. Mm. Yeah. You know what? I, I'll, I'll, um, I feel like that's a first for the podcast that I've heard. Growing old is underrated. I've never, <laughs> we haven't had that one yet. Um, it is so underrated. I'm, it's, I'm living my, it's hard sometimes, but it's like, like, that's what I wish I'd known. Like, it's going to get, it's going to be fine. You don't mm. need to like, it's all going to work out. Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's where I, um, here's where I want to finish. Please. What, um, What's the vision? Where do you go? Where do you go from here? Like if we were going to ha be having a conversation 10 years from now, what do you think you'd be talking about? What would be the landmark moment? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, one is I'm like one is professionally we're preparing for either, you know, the next is, what does a transition look like in terms of the company? Um, is it an IPO? Like, what is it that you want to get? We're at that place where we're starting to think, what does three to four years away look like? What does five years away look like? So mm -hmm. for the company, I want to be able to impact the way that people receive benefits and the way that people get help and the way that people interact with government so that it is, a, it is an experience that is humane, that is an advocate that is built for them. And I want to do that at scale. Like the more people we impact, the better we can be. I think for personally in 10 years um i want to i want to be healthier than i am today and i want to be happier than i am today and i think that's how i'll measure success ultimately is am i making decisions that are aligned with the kind of life that i want to lead and there's a luxury of time right thinking you know like and i hope you're you're doing this but the, for me as i get older it's like it's nice to think what am i building 10 years out instead of what am i doing 10 minutes out 10 days out 10 months and so, so I appreciate the question and, and, um, you know, my greatest hope is that I am, um, happier in 10 years than I am today. Yeah. You know, I think this will be, um, this is one of my favorite episodes I've done. I just feel like, oh, um, yay. I feel like it's going to be, I, I, I love all the episodes for different reasons, but I just, I don't know. I just feel like this one, if people, um, really listen to it, um, there's there's just so much there and um yeah definitely whenever you're in new york next we should do we should do one in studio in person and uh, i would love to but my yeah. you know my tribal ways i don't leave the house a lot <laughs> 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 and i'm so happy we had this time together and i'm so happy that ruben introduced us i know me too really remarkable thank you so much thank you it was so nice to meet you nice Spend to meet you as well you. if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe to the channel. We're having fire conversations every week on the podcast. Before we end the episode, a quick word from our sponsor, Free Agency. What if I told you there is a good chance you're leaving money on the table in your career? It would kind of annoy you a bit, right? Well, Free Agency aims to stop that. They represent and manage talent in the tech industry. Here's how they do it. First, they provide you with a dedicated talent agent. Think about this as your career quarterback. They understand you and your career goals, Based on that understanding, they bring you suitable interviews at top firms. You focus on smashing the interview and together with their network, research, negotiation expertise, they will make sure you get a top of market salary. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with free agency.